a bigger, it's interesting. There's definitely an audience here. University of Arizona puts on science cafes to engage community in different areas. Um, one here at Borderlands is actually the Carson Scholars um, Borderlands Brewing Science Cafe. Um, we do talks once a month on the second uh, Thursday of every month. It's going in and out a little, huh? Okay. Can we hear now? Okay, cool. Um, tonight is actually MFA candidate Hannah Hindley, and before we get to her, I just want to talk a little bit about the Carson Scholars Program. Um, Carson Scholars Program engages graduate students at the U of A with a fellowship, a year-long fellowship opportunity to learn about um, science communication and what that means, how to communicate your research and what you're doing um, to everybody so that there can be a deeper connection with the research going on that you are doing. Um, and like I said, Hannah is here with us tonight, MFA candidate in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences Department of English, um, sharing about glacier ice melt and slush lanches. And I'll let you take it away. <laughs> awesome. Good crowd tonight. I'm just going to switch my slide situation here quickly and then I'll introduce myself a little bit better. Great. All right. So good evening again, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Hindley, yeah. um, and I am one of the 2018 Carson Scholars here. I think maybe actually the final Carson Scholar from my uh, cohort to be giving one of these science talks. Uh, and appropriately, I'm not really a true scientist so much as a science writer and, and researcher. Um, my background is in English and biology. Um, and uh, I've spent these last 10 years or so working as a wilderness guide in Alaska and elsewhere and came back to the University of Arizona um, because I really believe that um, the world needs more and better science and environment communication. Uh, and so that's the work and the research that, that I do. Still figuring out the mechanics of this situation. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the writing that I do is writing about other folks' research also. Um, I've done a good amount of science writing during my time here at U of A um, on local stories and local researchers working um, in all sorts of spheres. Uh, but tonight, for our Borderlands talk, we're going to take a journey uh, that isn't quite so local. Instead, we're going to be traveling to Alaska together, just in time for Arizona's coming heat wave. I know when many of you imagine your upcoming trip to Alaska with me, uh, these might be some of the visions that you have of the Alaska that you might find in the far north, pipelines and igloos and polar bears, maybe some politicians. Um, but instead, the Alaska that uh, I'm going to guide you into this evening looks a little bit more like this. Is this microphone working all right? getting some ringing. Cool. Um, so tonight we're going to be traveling instead to Alaska's glacier country, to a land of big mountains and grizzly bears or coastal brown bears here, um, boreal forests and huge 
glaciers. We're going to be traveling together to Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Have any of you ever been? Yes! Amazing! We'll have to share stories sometime. Um, so we're traveling to Wrangell St. Elias National Park, which is this very small, very small red blotch on the map here, but that's actually the nation's largest national park there in red down in some train interludes as well before the night's over. Cool. Um, so while that might look like a small splotch on the map, that's actually America's largest national park, Wrangell St. Elias. It's bigger than Yellowstone, Yosemite, and all of Switzerland combined. Uh, and actually in combination with um, Canadian national parks that it borders to the east uh, and Glacier Bay National Park to the south, uh, that one continuous land swath is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the largest contiguous wilderness area in our world, second to Antarctica. Uh, so it might look small on this map, um, but on the right-hand side, uh, you've got a little bit more of a close-up uh, view of what that national park looks like, bordering the ocean down to the south in Yakutat, and you can see in yellow on that map uh, the only two little roads leading into this huge uh, wilderness area that I spent my time researching this summer. Um, and uh, my goal during my time in Wrangell St. Elias National Park was kind of twofold. I was there as a science writer interested in, in the research that's happening in this park, um, but uh, also there because uh, as a researcher and as a writer, stories are my data. Uh, and I was looking um, into Wrangell St. Elias National Park in particular because its story is a unique one. Uh, the vision of the national park when it was founded was just a little bit different than most other national parks. Uh, when, uh, when the park was founded, uh, the National Park Service, and I'm quoting here, prescribes that park and preserve protection are not meant exclusively for natural and cultural resources. It also extends to people, their lifestyles, and intangible associations with the land. And so when I traveled to Wrangell St. Elias National Park, I was interested in those people also and in uh, the lives that are led right at, right at the edge of the ice and in what questions or answers human community at the edge of these huge melting glaciers might have. Uh, and so uh, that was my intent as I traveled into the heart of this little red wilderness area. If I had arrived in what's now Wrangell St. Elias National Park 2,000 years ago, I would have arrived in the company of the Atna people, whose name means the Ice People, and who still live in the Copper River Valley uh, in and just outside of the current uh, park boundaries. I might have entered in moose skin boat or wearing snowshoes in the winter, and very likely I would have used the big glaciers in, in this national park um, over 5,000 square miles of glaciers as highway systems in uh, my nomadic lifestyle, uh, moving back and forth across the four huge mountain ranges that uh, traverse this national park and trading with other people uh, across those valleys and across those glaciers. Uh, I probably would have spent most of uh, the late 17 and early 1800s fighting off the Russians successfully. But if I had arrived maybe about 150 years ago, I might have been lucky enough to have a couple of horses to ride. As I pushed into what's now Wrangell St. Elias National Park, I might have arrived with some of the early US military survey expeditions that started pushing into the Wrangell Mountains uh, just after Alaska was purchased in 1867. Uh, and it was during one of these uh, military survey expeditions that 
uh, a hungry chief Nikolai, uh, looking to save his people from a particularly harsh winter, uh, sold information as to where a particularly rich copper vein was to one of these survey leaders in exchange for food to keep his people alive that winter. And that really changed the course of the history of Wrangell St. Elias National Park, which is home to one of the world's purest copper deposits. So if I had arrived maybe a hundred years ago in what's now Wrangell St. Elias National Park, I probably would have arrived by train. Uh, nearly 200 miles of train track connect Wrangell St. Elias to the outside world. A huge amount of that track is built on trellises that cross over rivers that just rage with icebergs during the winter. Uh, and hundreds upon hundreds of, uh, of workers were involved in building, building these massive tracks and trellises in order to reach the little mining outpost of Kennecott, which in this photo you can see there's a big snowy expanse off to the left hand side of the image that's actually the root glacier coming down next to uh, the mining community of Kennecott, um, which is the community that I lived in during my research this last summer. But the glacier, while it extended above the height of the buildings in Kennecott a hundred years ago, back when it was a uh, thriving mining community, uh, during my time in Wrangell St. Elias was instead um, below the level of town and covered with a thick layer of rocky debris from uh, the thinning, the glacial thinning that's been happening uh, just outside of Kennecott. If I'd arrived in what's now Wrangell St. Elias National Park back in the 1980s or so, the train track would have been mostly covered by dirt road. And I would have traveled by road 60 miles until I reached the Kennecott River. And then I would have had to climb into a rickety hand-powered tram to pull myself across the Kennecott River. Is that when you were in Wrangell St. Elias? Did you, did you use a hand tram? I bet you walked across the footbridge. <laughs> we'll have to compare stories afterward. Uh, so uh, I would have had to pull myself by hand across that tram in order to get to the little town of McCarthy. And I should clarify, I use the names McCarthy and Kennecott interchangeably. They're kind of one continuous community now, but back in the day, Kennecott was the mining town and McCarthy was the town where the miners could travel five miles down the road to get a little drink and maybe a little female companionship also. Um, but today, um, they're uh, very close-knit little communities there on the other side of the river. Hopefully, if I had arrived back in the 1980s, I wouldn't have arrived in the early spring of 1982 uh, when about half the town's population was killed in a mass shooting at the local airstrip. Um, but the town uh, rallied and survived that loss. The airstrip is still in operation, uh, and that's another great way to get into town if you're not willing to travel that long dirt road. The tramway was replaced with a footbridge uh, in the late 90s, and so when I traveled to Wrangell St. Elias last year, uh, instead my journey looked a little bit like this. Uh, there was a warning sign at the beginning of the road uh, reminding me that there would be no services from there on out, and for 62 miles I traveled down that dirt road where permafrost continues to push up old railroad spikes, uh, and where uh, big walls and cliffs have been carved away to allow for the passage of that old train. Uh, it's the kind of road where you need to get pretty good at changing tires, those railroad spikes are treacherous. We were thinking about starting a tire changing service with a smile. Uh, and then uh, when I arrived in Wrangell St. Elias National Park, instead of pulling myself across by hand, I got to the end of that dirt road. There still uh, aren't any roads that lead all the way across that river into the town of McCarthy or Kennecott. Instead, you have to walk that last little stretch of the way by foot across a little bridge that runs over a river filled with meltwater from the root into Kennecott glaciers, which flow down uh, past Kennecott um, and melt out near McCarthy. Uh, here's a quick aerial view just to kind of um, ground you all in the landscape that we're going to be living inside of this evening. Um, you can see in in the satellite view here kind of a V shape um, descending down um, from the top of the map and those are the Kennecott Glacier to the left and the Root Glacier to the right which merge and you can see that kind of rubbly dark debris on their surface where the glacier continues to thin and kind of plop out the rocks on top of itself that have been locked inside of it as it's kind of cheese grated its way down through the mountains and collect that, collected that debris load. And so um, if you can see from your perch, I know it's not a great screen for visibility here in Borderlands, but um, there's a big red kind of 
uh, wobbly shape there that represents the borders of what's now Kennecott McCarthy. And the little town of McCarthy sits kind of a little ways below where the glacier ends. Actually, the satellite image must have been taken a few years ago because the glacier has receded a good bit since then. And if a current satellite image were to be taken, um, you would see instead a lake above McCarthy before the glacier begins. So things are things are changing pretty quickly here in, um, in Kennecott and McCarthy in glacier country where a lot of these big rivers of ice are kind of slinking lower and farther back up into the mountains, which is what was of interest to me as I traveled in search of some climate change answers. Uh, this is what uh, the mining buildings look like now in the town where I was living in Kennecott. And uh, I arrived in, in Wrangell St. Elias partly to do research and then um, Although Carson Scholars is very generous in their funding, also in order to work a little bit to pay my way uh, through my summer experience. And so I, I spent my summer uh, guiding part-time also um, at a little outpost here in the old mining village, taking people out for ice climbing trips and for walks across the Root Glacier, where we would uh, walk through uh, the remains of this old mining town, which the National Park is working really hard to preserve as a gesture towards that effort, not just to preserve natural resources, but human history here also. Um, and I would take folks for adventures out on the ice. Um, it's a beautiful place, as those of you who have traveled there know, um, and it's hard to describe two-dimensionally or just with my voice exactly what that experience is like to uh, kind of crunch out onto these big, moving, living bodies of ice coming down from the mountains, but that's exactly what I would do with folks um, day in and day out this last summer. And uh, on one day early in my summer experience guiding in Wrangell St. Elias, I took a couple out on the ice, and we spent all day traversing the ice, hopping over little meltwater creeks and poking our noses inside of ice caves um, and kind of getting a sense for just the scale of, of these big bodies of ice coming down from the mountains. And at the end of the trip, as we were sitting back down on the rocks at the edge of the glacier and taking off our crampons, the woman turned to me, she was an economist, and asked, what's the value of all of this? If you could pin a value, a money value to glaciers, what would it be? And I was kind of, I was kind of speechless because it would have been really easy to give kind of like a MasterCard priceless answer to her, which, which is kind of what my gut response was, but it also got me thinking. Um, and this was the question that I kept in the back of my mind as I continued my summer um, up in the company of these big living bodies of ice was, what really is the value of ice? And how do the different community members here who move in and out of Kennecott and McCarthy and who kind of live and breathe this ice country and this ice culture, what kind of value do they place on this landscape? In particular, at a time when the landscape is changing very quickly and when that thing that they might value the most is possibly on its way out day by day and year by year. Um, and so uh, for the rest of, of this little chat tonight, and I'll do my best to cram it into half an hour, but uh, for the rest of tonight's talk, um, this is going to be my guiding question also as I look at the different angles um, that people look at the value of ice from. And I think probably the, the easiest answer, at least for my economist friend out on the ice, um, would be a money-based answer, right? Um, there is a, a huge economic value um, to glacier country and the resources that it provides um, at a very basic level, uh, a huge number of folks who, who live um, inside of the communities of McCarthy and Kennecott make their living off of the glaciers. Uh, so outdoor recreation is a big deal in Wrangell St. Elias National Park, although not a lot of people make it across that little footbridge all the way into the heart of this pretty remote park. Um, but uh, as a whole, um, in Alaska, there are about 72,000 people employed in outdoor recreation, and um, that amounts to um, over $2 billion in, in just wages and salaries for them, let alone the kind of economic ripple effect. So you can imagine um, if you were to scale that down to a little community like McCarthy, Kennecott, which granted only has about 35 year-round residents, um, maybe 150 or so in the summer months when seasonal workers come through, um, that's still probably a pretty big percentage of, of the folks who live and work there. Um, so a, a pretty big, important um, economic factor, the folks who guide people out onto the glaciers to go ice, ice climbing, or the park rangers um, who are all local hires from the Copper River Valley who have lived there their whole lives and um, make a living off of working for the National Park Service. Um, but another really kind of important economic 
uh, factor behind behind these big glaciers, and and one that's maybe just like one one step of connectivity is how many of you have eaten Copper River Reds, Copper River salmon? Yeah, ideally paired with maybe some Noche Dulce or some from Fresca or any number of Borderlands brews, um, but delicious salmon come out of the the Copper River Valley, right? Um, the Copper River is the 10th largest river in the United States. It's known for its, I got a picture, its extensive delta system, and it drains uh, an area greater than 24,000 square miles, which is about the size of West Virginia. So huge river system fed by annual glacial melt, right? These huge glaciers are kind of like eternal spring that's coming down from these mountains, constantly being replenished by snow in their upper reaches, which compresses and compacts and turns into glacial ice over the course of really only a couple of years under the heavy weight of that, that snowfall that hits those high mountains every year. And as those glaciers kind of plasticize and begin moving downhill, uh, part of the glacier's natural life cycle is also to melt at its toe, right? It's kind of uh, a story of give and take, if we're going to draw metaphors from the life of a glacier. Um, and uh, the give is massive. Alaska's glacier country fuels some of the biggest salmon rivers in our nation, in the world. Um, and uh, those, those have a huge economic value too. Um, over $20 million a year in commercial fishing. Um, I think there was an article that came out a year or two ago where Copper River salmon was selling for $75 a pound. Uh, so really valuable wild caught salmon. And then uh, a lot of economic value also, which is a little tougher to calculate, but subsistence fishing too, and sport fishing in the Copper River Valley where the Atna people still um, survive largely by subsistence off of the Copper River, driving up toward uh, the park where I lived. I would pass by massive fish wheels set out in the water and dip netters. Uh, like this young woman off to the left um, who uh, are part of the Atna community and who um, still fish for those salmon in traditional ways. And that amounts to about $5 million in value too. So plenty of money value, right? Easy answer and actually still probably not a very calculable answer when you start thinking about ripple effects and all of the kind of monies that move with the ice here. Um, but of course, there are other less tangible values to glacial ice too, as those of you who have visited glacier country or dreamed of glacier country, uh, no, right? And so for the rest of my summer, I, I worked to find more complex answers to that question. Um, and one of those answers was with uh, a researcher, a geologist named Milene Jacquemart, uh, who was a visiting geologist. She's not a local resident in McCarthy, but she spent several weeks out there this last summer uh, flying by helicopter and bush plane out into a really remote corner of the park called Mount Stolzer, where she was studying the hot topic word for the night, slush avalanches, <laughs> which is not, I don't think, an official Wikipedia designated word yet, um, but it's the word that the Wrangell St. Elias National Park geologist, Mike Loso, uses to describe these big events. Um, and these aren't events that only happen in Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Uh, this is something that's been witnessed um, elsewhere in the world too, um, to kind of catastrophic effect in, in glacier regions where other communities kind of live up close to that melting edge the way that people in McCarthy do. Um, and I have a, a video here that might help explain what a slush avalanche is a little bit better than I can just with my words. Essentially, these are massive ice avalanches that, that occur um, in glacial regions here and in Tibet and the Himalayas uh, that uh, can be catastrophic, fast-moving events um, where huge portions of glaciers break loose and essentially discharge out down a valley and, and disappear. Um, generally, glaciers are moving things. They are kind of like living animals, these bodies of ice. Um, and they can move quickly sometimes when they flow. Um, there are old stories in Glacier Bay National Park of glacial surges where the glaciers moved at least the, the Kungit people, um, the Huna, who live in that area, say the glaciers move about as quickly as a dog can run. But in general, a glacier, a glacier takes its time. A glacier moves maybe a meter or so a day, three or four feet a day, gradually downhill as it's kind of compressed and pushed by um, more snowfall and ice that's, that's spilling in from above. Um, but in this case, I'll give you a visual as to what one of these slush avalanches looks like. This was kind of freak footage that was caught by a bush pilot who just happened to be traveling near Mount Sulzer um, when one of these events broke loose. It was, this is either the second or the third slush avalanche 
that has happened in the Mount Seltzer area in the last three or four years. Um, nope. Let's try that again. Here we go. So a little shaky as the pilot uh, moved here, but you can see um, kind of on the left side of the screen, uh, it looks like a whitewater river, right? And that's glacial ice that's broken loose from up above and is kind of careening down this river valley. If you look above where that white river is moving, you can see it just like kind of bare, naked land. And that's where uh, the former larger slush lanch broke loose that no one was around to witness, but you can see where it stripped every last tree off the land up to about 2,000 feet. So we're talking enormous volume of ice uh, moving downhill at a pretty alarmingly fast rate, right? if any of you can see that. I know the visuals aren't great here, um, but I'm sure that bush pilot didn't know what he was looking at um, when he started filming this. Pretty wild, and, and this is this is what Mélène Jacquemart uh, was studying. Is she, she got permission to land here kind of in the, the chaos, the devastation left behind by the slush lanch, and um, she walked through by these mounds of just like exploded rocks and, and journeyed up toward where uh, the glacier begins up on Mount Salter in order to plant equipment and kind of measure the ground and temperatures um, and in order to set up kind of long-term monitoring uh, equipment that would allow her to match when these events happen on Mount Seltzer with, um, with maybe like local weather conditions or, or other, um, other variables that might help us figure out what's causing these, these massive glaciers. Her best um, kind of broad guess right now is these are probably pretty clearly associated with climate change and, and ice softening. Um, and this is something that, again, is happening is happening globally too. Um, some of you may have read in the news a couple of years ago about a couple of different huge slush avalanches uh, that broke loose in Tibet. One of them uh, devastated, just swallowed an entire village and yak herd. Um, and so uh, the research that Milene Shakamart is doing is, is highly relevant to kind of uh, global human communities and safety here in these places where people live in close proximity to big mountains and big glaciers. Um, and these events are happening more and more regularly and they're still very mysterious. So in answer to the question, what's the value of glaciers for Milene Jacquemart, uh, the value that she sees in glaciers uh, is in their stability and their ability to, to hold their form um, and not to, not to break loose and cause these devastating events. Right. Uh, I did not have the opportunity to visit Mont Salter where uh, Milene Jacquemart was doing her work, but I did travel uh, to a glacier called the Nizina Glacier uh, just about a week after another catastrophic event happened there. Um, there is a big glacial calving, which for those of you who aren't as familiar with kind of glacier dynamics, is an event where, uh, where these big glaciers come down and meet water. They tend to develop very, very sheer faces um, where um, big uh, sheets of ice will break loose and crash down into the water in front of them. In a lot of cases, these calvings happen on salt water, where tide water glaciers come down to the sea. In this case, the Nazina Glacier has a, a big lake in front of it. And uh, just the week before, a small group had been out in the backcountry uh, and had almost gotten washed away by a huge tidal wave uh, that pushed out from the face of the Nazina Glacier when a piece of ice about a quarter of a mile long broke loose and just splintered apart in this lake um, and left them running for their lives with their gear. Um, I don't have video footage of that, although I think one of them might have shot uh, some footage. I got to hear from the guides afterward, um, kind of the, the chaos and wildness at the moment. No one, no one in the community who has lived there for, for many years had heard of an event like this happening at the Nazina Glacier. So uh, when I traveled to Nazina uh, the week after the event, you can see from up above um, a lot of the breakage still left in that glacial lake from, from where that big uh, calving happened. It kind of looks like peanut brittle from up above. Um, from down low, uh, we had to cross the lake by pack raft, which are little inflatable backcountry boats. And you can see the size of some of those uh, icebergs that broke loose during that calving. We're talking mansion-sized icebergs drifting through that lake, breaking apart, uh, and then continuing their journey down the Nizina River. So got to witness firsthand uh, some of the big changes and collapses and catastrophes that are beginning to happen in glacier country where uh, for uh, most of human history in this landscape, uh, glaciers have followed more predictable patterns. Right, so a little firsthand witnessing. Um, 
Let's see, uh, some more glacial value here. This is a picture of a local named Paul Hannes. He was not born in McCarthy, but has lived there for um, several decades now. Um, and as a young man, arrived in the town of McCarthy by foot after spending um, a couple of months traversing the length of this huge national park um, as a, a backcountry adventurer. And when he pulled up in the little town of McCarthy, he knew he had reached home. He set up a little guiding business um, and ran it successfully for a number of years um, and uh, ended up selling it a few years back, although um, I met with him in the old office that used to be part of his guiding business, which looks out over what remains of uh, the terminus of the Root Glacier. And I caught him looking out the back window and remembering what that view used to look like uh, when he guided there 20 years ago. And um, he just had kind of a sad expression on his face. and. Uh, he looked back at me and said, this view has changed a lot. Um, but now Paul Hannes lives uh, in a teepee, a winterized teepee, uh, just to give you a sense for what kind of people live here year-round in McCarthy, uh, on the banks of the Nizina River, which is the river that flows down from that glacier that I visited earlier in the summer. Um, and he, uh, he leaves town from time to time to work oil up toward the Arctic, um, but he also works as an artist. He paints wildflowers during the summer and crafts these beautiful uh, frames out of the driftwood that's polished by these glacial rivers. Um, but mostly, he waits for winter. He's an ice carver, um, and uh, he relies on kind of that deep freeze of interior Alaska in order to make his art. Um, you can see a quick image of it here, but um, there's some beautiful images online also. Um, and uh, he, he thinks of glaciers as living things. Uh, he talks about the ice that he carves as, um, as making ghostly homes when he carves it and talks about the atomic energy that ice holds and the way that it serves as a vessel for light. Uh, and he's lived close to this ice and shaped it with his own hands for many years now. So for, for Paul Hannes, for an artist, for a local who has seen the coming and going of seasons uh, in Kennecott and McCarthy, for him, the value of ice seems to be its beauty. And I think that's not a value to be overlooked. Uh, this is a picture of a young man named Nate Anderson, um, who for some time was the director of the Wrangell Mountain Center, which is a fantastic little hub uh, where scientists and artists and writers from all over the world converge in this tiny community at the base of the glacier to do research and to make art together. Um, and uh, he came to uh, the Wrangell Mountain Center and to Kennecott and McCarthy as a glaciologist. Um, and a researcher. He's no longer there now. He recently left and is in Africa now, uh, in, in Uganda, I believe, um, studying uh, glacial moraines from the last ice age and trying to piece together bigger stories as a graduate student now at Dartmouth. Um, but his work in Wrangell St. Elias during his time there as a geologist um, was looking at phenomena uh, out on these glaciers called ogives. It was very loud. Uh, <laughs> called ojas, which um, happen at the base of uh, what we call ice falls. Um, and uh, the Root Glacier is home to one of the world's highest ice falls, actually the second highest ice fall, second only to the one on Everest, which is about a mile and a half tall, 7,000 feet of vertical ice as um, the glacier kind of spills over one of these mountain lips and just descends into the Kennecott Valley. Um, and the ice falls um, is chaos. Um, just sharp crackling ice that shears loose all the time and no ice climber has ever ventured near it but uh, Nate Anderson's work uh, was to traverse the ridges kind of paralleling this ice fall and to set up time-lapse videos that would help him understand um, glacial physics and dynamics as uh, this ice fall descends and and what we learned at the base of these big ice falls is that um, as this ice crushes down and, and begins moving down valley, it takes on really regular wave-like formations called ogives. And there's a lot we still don't understand about them. And it's actually very hazardous work going out on the glacier to study them and to learn how glacial ice moves. Uh, he took a time-lapse video here, which is very short, although I think it was the work of a couple or three months of time-lapse footage. Um, and I'll play it a couple of times for you um, just to orient you. Uh, the, the left hand side of the screen here is where that vertical ice fall uh, descends and the right hand side of the screen is where the glacial levels out and begins flowing into the Kennecott Valley. Oops. Try that again. So you can see the passage of time here as that glacial moves almost like a river, um, but this is 
time lapse rather than real life like the slush lanch, right? So we're looking at very slow moving ice uh, sped up. And you can see, I should point up here, uh, you can see on the left hand side of the screen um, where those very regular bulbous waves begin forming. I'll play that one more time so you can see those perfect little ripples. Those are the ogives. Um, and uh, Nate is still working on putting together a paper that kind of answers some questions about these ogives. Um, for me, I think the beauty of his work is looking at how uh, this kind of perfect order can arise out of chaos, right? Um, but for Nate, um, the value of these glaciers to him is... Wait for it. We all knew this would happen. M maybe I can go? <laughs> all right, for Nate, uh, the value of these glaciers lies in their mystery and the answers that still are answered, or the questions that still are answered, I should say, and also in the questions that we have um, decreasing time left to answer, uh, right, while these glaciers are still here and dynamically changing. Uh, and so uh, Nate feels a certain urgency in tracking down some of these mysteries, like the ogives, and coming to understand how such beautiful order can arise out of the chaos of, of falling ice. Um, I should mention also, we're talking about community here and the different values, um, the values that ice might hold, but um, when we talk about community, we're talking about more than just humans too, right? Um, ice country up in the Wrangell Mountains and the other mountain ranges that crisscross. Uh, this land that I'm talking about are home to extraordinary animals. This is a picture, yes, of bear poop. Um, we call it scat. It's full of berries. Um, and uh, this wasn't taken out on a glacier, but these bears and other animals in these mountains use these glaciers in order to get um, from place to place. The mountains and the wrangles are notoriously sleep, steep and slippery and full of crumbly rock, um, and critters have a hard time moving around and migrating there. Um, in fact, there aren't a huge number of migratory animals right in the Kennecott Valley just by virtue of the landscape there. Uh, and uh, on several occasions, I've uh, looked out across the glacier and seen a bear just scrambling off of the ice and beginning to climb uphill, or sometimes I'll come across piles of this berry-laden scat out on the ice where the heat from the poop has kind of melted the ice down. And it's clear that these glaciers are highway systems in a landscape that um, otherwise might be very isolating for animals um, in places where those mountains are tricky to traverse. And so uh, the glaciers lend connectivity to um, a pretty large scale um, and challenging landscape to survive in. There's also, I think these slides are out of order, but there's also kind of a, a bittersweetness, a bittersweetness to, um, to the loss of ice, to the thinning of ice here in Wrangell St. Elias and elsewhere where we're seeing big glaciers thin down and kind of recede. Um, this is a picture of Ben Shane, uh, who's a longtime resident of Kennecott McCarthy. This, this man was also largely responsible for setting the land aside as a national park. He fought hard for it um, back in the 70s and 80s um, and uh, succeeded in protecting this land for the community out there and, and for the preservation of, of the landscape. Um, and uh, Ben Shane, um, when, when, when we met, uh, kept uh, checking his his phone as we were talking, and I don't think it was because he didn't enjoy my company, um, but, uh, and then there is cell service if you have Verizon now in the valley, and that's really changed a lot of things for a lot of people. <laughs> um, but he was checking his phone because his grown daughter, who had grown up with him in, in McCarthy and Kennecott, actually somewhere on the dirt road between the two little towns, uh, had come back to visit, and she had headed down to the glacier on her own that day to explore and to kind of revisit her playground from her childhood. And she brought an ice axe with her and a helmet and her phone, hopefully. Who knows? Um, daughters don't often call their fathers unsolicitedly. Um, but Ben Chang was checking anyway just to, just to make sure that she was safe because what he told me was, although this young woman had grown up next to this very glacier, she just walked down the hill from her front door. He told me she's visiting a new glacier. 
And this is something that was true for me every day that I headed out there also is that um, every time I stepped on that ice, it was new ice I was stepping on, right? The glacier is continually shifting and replenishing itself. Meltwater streams are carving out new caves, which then collapse on themselves. And it's a, a really dynamic landscape. Um, and uh, Ben Shane, more than anyone who's lived here for many, many years, um, recognizes that um, it's a landscape that um, not only changes, but is, is lost readily, too. Um, he talked about the little town of McCarthy, kind of like the end of a whip, where small changes that are beginning to happen elsewhere in our world are going to be amplified uh, here in this community, right at the edge of the ice, right, right at the melting edge. Um, and uh, Ben Shane doesn't know what the future might hold for this little town and for the changing glacier and for the people who rely on that glacier for, for their livelihood and who also have perhaps arrived um, in, in McCarthy in order to call it home, um, looking for escape from the bigger changes in the outside world, only to realize that maybe this is the place that's going to see those changes first and, and fastest. Um, so I didn't ask Ben Shane directly uh, what it was that he valued about the ice, but during that conversation with him, it became clear to me that the value of the ice for him was the value of kind of a life's love, the value of home, right? As I'm sure we can all relate to in home places that are changing in their own ways. Um, that bittersweetness extends also to kind of what comes from, uh, wow, this is all out of order, kind of, <laughs> kind of what comes from the, uh, the ice melt that's happening here. Um, and uh, there are no black and white answers in a little town like McCarthy. This, uh, these are a couple of pictures from the annual 4th of July parade. Did you happen to be there during the 4th of July? No, shake. We're going to have to decide on our stories over there. <laughs> um, if you did, you might not remember it. It's, it's a pretty fun holiday, probably the best 4th of July celebration in our country. Um, and a reminder that even though this place is very isolated, it is, it is still America. Um, what I don't have pictured here is the float from this year's um, River Rafting Guides uh, parade entry, where on the side of their bus they had painted the words, Alaskan Raft Guides for Climate Change. Uh, and I imagine that um, they're their slogan was tongue-in-cheek to a degree, but the truth of it is that uh, the river guides and the people who love the rivers love the glaciers for their melts, right? The value that they place on the ice is, is the hydrology, the big watersheds that are born out of these big glaciers. Um, and uh, it's a good reminder that um, this increasing melt is, is changing the river landscapes too in ways that um, can feel positive for, for certain folks who depend on that water for, for their livelihoods. Um, this is a, I don't have a before image, but this is an after image of a meltwater lake at the edge of uh, the Root Glacier. This is called Erie Lake, um, which uh, that meltwater will collect behind the glacier over the course of a season. And, and this is not a historic event necessarily, although events like this have happened throughout time as glaciers have moved and changed in landscapes. But this is an event that uh, has occurred more and more regularly um, over these last few years, locals tell me. Um, it's an event called a yokelop, which is a Scandinavian word, essentially for glacier flood. And what happens is these um, meltwater lakes will collect behind uh, glaciers on the edges of them, and ice plugs will melt loose and burst, and the entire contents of those lakes will kind of purge out over the course of maybe a single day. So we're talking catastrophic water flow, um, huge floods, house-sized icebergs just clattering down river, um, shuddering against that little footbridge, which astoundingly still stands. Um, although I think they have had to replace it at least once. Um, but these big floods happen um, historically, annually, um, sometimes now biannually, as more and more of this ice is melting and kind of needs outlet. This is what that lake looks like just after a yokel up where all of the uh, little chunks, I shouldn't say little, where the largest chunks of ice have, have broken off, uh, were floating in the water and are now left kind of grounded in this big ice garden on the edge of the glacier. Um, but when the yokel up comes, it's a local holiday in McCarthy. Everyone living there comes down to the footbridge bring some beverages. I don't think Borderlands distributes quite that far north, but if they did, I'm sure there'd be some Noche Dulce up there. Um, and, uh, and they celebrate. Some hardy river guides will jump in their little inflatable kayaks, their pack rafts, and raft the yokel up. It looks a little bit like this. It's hard uh, to get a sense of scale here, but this is that big meltwater river um, coming out from the toe of the glacier. That little speck 
is a person in a very small kayak rafting this massive flood, dodging icebergs. Um, you can see some of the bigger waves and um, rapids forming near the bridge there. I don't think I have footage of anyone capsizing, but it has happened. Um, but it, it becomes kind of a feat of endurance. Here come a couple more stragglers. That one's going sideways. Um, so, <laughs> um, a little bittersweet, right? Um, for rafting guides, the value of glaciers is in their melt. Um, another thing to uh, remember also is that as glaciers recede, they make way for new life also. Um, <clears throat> Let me see if I can find my place here. Um, melting glaciers spawn extraordinary ecosystems. Glaciers are one of the, the few um, places where we witness in this world what we call primary succession. We witness it also in lava fields where kind of life gets swept clean away and then returns out of kind of sterile moonscape, right? And this happens in glacier country too where that ice recedes. Um, little bits of light start creeping back in, uh, we begin to see cryptobiotic crests of cyanobacteria and mosses, little lichens creeping out along rocks and acidifying them just enough that the rocks maybe split, just enough to let a root in. Um, and uh, within about five years of ice receding, we begin to see what we call pioneer species, hardy little species, usually very pretty, very deceivingly delicate looking little flowers um, that will take root in those split rocks that the lichens have prepared um, and will begin blooming out over these rubbly moonscapes. Most of those pioneer species are nitrogen fixers, so they have the ability to pull nitrogen in out of the air around them and fix it into a usable form in their roots. Um, they often have symbiotic associations with either a fungus or a bacteria that lets them do this work, which is really rare in the plant world. Um, so we'll see those little flowers um, growing in, uh, and willows also are good at fixing nitrogen for themselves. And within about 50 or 60 years of ice receding, we see alder forests, deciduous trees beginning to grow. And about 200 years after a glacier has slunk back from a landscape, spruce forests will fill in and grow. And so um, in many ways, glaciated landscapes and, and, and the loss of ice allows for just this laboratory for life uh, to find a way in um, kind of bittersweet, but, but very beautiful ways, right? Uh, these new waves of life adapted for kind of a new world that they live in. So um, this is a picture of the, the root glacier. That's Mount Donahoe, that big pyramid mountain in the middle of the shot. And just behind it, if you can see the snowy mountain um, off to the left, um, that uh, is a 16,000 foot mountain, first scaled by a woman in a wool skirt named Dora Keene. Um, she was pretty great, um, but you can see in the, the lower right-hand corner of the image, um, way up toward that lower right-hand corner, a few small spruce trees beginning to grow, uh, and then you can see kind of the absence of life as you get lower down toward the glacier where the ice has not been absent as long. And if you look way across that image, I know visuals here aren't great, but you can see a thin gray stripe where no life has returned just yet. And that's what we call the trim line. That would have been the highest extent of the root glacier during the last little ice age. That would have been about as high as the ice was when, when miners first arrived in Kennecott. And that's about oh, 100 feet above current glacial level right now. So big changes. And you can see some of that, what we call succession, those, those plants beginning to come back in. So looking ahead, uh, maybe 2,000 years ago, you ride, might have arrived by moose hide boat um, or by horse. A hundred years from now, it's hard saying exactly what Wrangell St. Elias might look like or any of these other big landscapes up in glacier country. Uh, we know that uh, the Midwest and the Great Lakes were covered by glaciers once too. 10,000 years from now, maybe that's what this part of Alaska will look like. Central Park has glaciated rocks in it from the last ice age. Um, who knows what urban metropoli might come to the Wrangell Mountains? Probably not many. Um, hard to build around there, um, but uh, there are many changes that have already begun to arrive kind of at the threshold of glacier country and um, no answers necessarily to exactly um, how the community there might change and how the landscape might also, um, but um, those answers are complex too. It's, it's hard um, visiting the edge of the glacier and seeing these little bits of life returning. These are um, 
mountain avens, or we call them Einstein flowers, because as they, as they seed out and fluff up, they look like little Einstein hairdos, and they just catch the light like lanterns. And uh, these grow for miles and miles and miles, for miles and miles and miles of ice have been lost in the last five or 10 years. And it's hard to wade through those kind of lantern-like fields of fluff and not try to think of them as some kind of metaphor for um, the ways that life might adapt and succeed in a quickly changing world, although definitely resilience narratives um, aren't necessarily the only stories we should be telling um, during this quickly changing time, um, but certainly maybe a metaphor to hold on to as we think about our own answers here. I'm probably running over here too, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, Wrangell St. Elias is a place that has seen a lot of change over a lot of time, right? Ancient fossil beds where seas used to be, and also um, new life that is only just now um, filling in where ice is kind of fading back. Um, and um, for me, Wrangell St. Elias, um, while it tells many stories, more than anything does tell the story of community. Um, and not just the communities of little tufty Einstein flowers and, and spruce that are filling in, but also the community of humans that have stumbled into this park and kind of dug their heels in and decided to, to call it home. Um, and uh, I don't know what kinds of answers you came for tonight, um, but I definitely came away with more questions than answers from my one kind of brief summer there at the Melting Edge. Um, but if there are any answers that I came away with, I think um, they lie in the idea of community. Um, McCarthy is surviving and thriving against a lot of odds here, and it's been fascinating to interview and speak with some of the people who have known it as home for, for much longer than I ever will. Um, and I'm interested in how this place that you have now traveled to with me tonight um, might inspire our own stories about what we value and how we can navigate the things that are hard right now and how also we might act as a community locally and globally to survive and maybe thrive in this melting world. Uh, so I'll leave you maybe with your own questions too and I'm happy to try to answer some of them. Um, but thank you all for, for listening in. Are there questions? Yes. Yeah, so my job partially was researcher um, on my own terms, but I was, I was working for a little guiding company called Kennecott Wilderness Guides up in Kennecott. Highly recommend. Um, they uh, kind of customize little backcountry fly-ins and um, glacial hikes where we kind of parse apart the geology and natural history and human history of the area and kind of share the park. So, guide and writer. Yes, yeah, thanks. Other questions, comments, compliments? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's true, absolutely. I think actually a lot of the value of glaciers is in the hydrology of them. They're kind of the birthplace of so much important drinking water, fishery water. Yeah, absolutely. Is there questions? Most of you probably came here to drink beer and you're like, thank God she's done. Thank you. Question. Uh, how many people live in Kennecott was the question, and there are, it, it changes from year to year, but there are about 35 year-round residents, really small town, um, and then that balloons to maybe 150, 200 sometimes in the summer. Um, there's a lodge out there, and then guides, and um, national park workers, so it's a little, it's a little town, community, I should say, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, I worked out there actually last summer um, during my Carson research and then the summer before that and a little bit the summer before that. So um, it's, it's the kind of community that's hard to visit just once. Like you kind of want to dig your feet in a little deeper. So um, cumulatively, probably six or seven months. Am I going back this summer? <sighs> Am I going back this summer? I hope, I wish, but... It, it kind of depends on what kind of 
funding opportunities come my way too. But lots of questions that I'm still asking. So I'll be back, definitely. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, I'll be around for a little bit too, so feel free to um, come and chat, but also enjoy your beers and your, your freedom. Um, and thank you for being my captive audience. Thank you again, Anna. So just a few last notes before we let you all have your fun. So we first want to thank Borderlands, of course, for hosting us, and Mike Malozzi, the owner, came to us five years ago and allowed us to essentially share this space with you tonight. Also, there are some pamphlets on both ends of the bar, long-wise, and this gives a bunch of different science information about stuff associated with the University of Arizona or locally in Tucson. And we also have some surveys basically for the talk if you want to fill them out. And lastly, I mean, we crashed the party here, so we'd like to thank Seth, it's Seth, right? Yeah. Excellent. We'd like to thank Seth, he's going and leaving us in Tucson. He was a U of, he's a U of A alumni, so go Wildcats. He was here for 20 years in radio, and now he's leaving us to go to Phoenix. But, I don't know, I know. We know his Wildcat spirit will Stay strong. Thank you. Thank you.